So one of the things I want to talk about today is where to actually even begin. Um, some people come to me and say, what in the heck is big data? Do I have a big data problem? Do I even need this kind of stuff? And depending on the situation, the answer is yes or no. I'm the kind of guy that I'd like to say, um, uh, I want to leave you with a good taste in your mouth rather than forcing some product down your throat because someone's going to get happy. It's a checklist that you need to do. Let's use the right technology for the right purpose. This is a, a wiring closet um, that I found on the internet. I think it perfectly represents what we tend to find representing big data. There's opinions everywhere, everything is cross-connected, and it's extremely hard to get to the source of truth. What is actually going on? A little bit about me. Um, I just want to kind of give you a little bit about this. I've been there, done that a lot of industries. Um, some of the, the really cool things that I've done recently is a technical lead at the um, ID uh, portion of Nike. So whenever you buy a customized product, that was something flowing through my channels. Um, worked at the Air Force, and most recently I'm working for a large luxury retailer to uh, bring up an analytical warehouse uh, side by side with their custom uh, EDW. A um, couple places uh, that I want to point you to is the, the bigdatautalk.org website, even newhook.org. We're definitely trying to get the information out there to people, um, and I want to share everything in my brain. I, I really believe that. I believe there's a place for everyone, and there's no silos here. Going back to the spaghetti, I was interviewing a gentleman last week for a position, and uh, we were talking about ETL processes. And as you know, they're, they're no fun. Um, and particularly in life with big data. And he said, there's a tool out there from Tahoe. Who's here heard of Pentaho? Couple, okay. He said, just close your eyes, trust me, use Pentaho, you won't regret it. I, that killed the interview for me. Pentaho could be the greatest product in the world. He has absolutely no understanding of what goes on underneath. And this, for the organization that we're hiring for, they had no depth. Um, I was their depth, and I'm trying desperately to put myself out of a job to get other people trained up. But if you rely on these tool sets that are, that are whizzy waves and just drag and drop, and you wire things together, you run into some, some significant problems, which I can talk about uh, later on. That was part of the FUD that's out there. So let's play a little bit of buzzword bingo. Raise your hand if you've heard of any of these things. Or recognize the symbols. Guys, anyone know that one? Zookeeper. Oh, yeah, okay. Anyone heard of this one? One, one, spark, okay. This one, pig, okay, great. Sandra, couple, zoo, probably a little bit more, all right. H face, one, okay. Uh, hive, okay, a couple. Tez, that's a fairly new one. Okay, Mahout, some dude called Mahout, whatever you want to call it, and finally Solar. All these things kind of typically fall into the big data realm. Hive would be the SQL interface into the Hadoop ecosystem. Spark would be the real-time analysis, actually they're called micro-batches. So they're still doing the batch processing paradigm, but in a micro-batch uh, fashion. Mahout, Mahout is the machine learning libraries, and that's actually being phased out. The libraries that are here are moving into Spark into the, the, the very, very fast real time. HBase would be your, your NoSQL key value store, kind of the same thing as Cassandra. Um, Zookeeper is the coordinating mechanism between everything. It actually becomes a fundamental service in all of these things. But if you know what that is, that's the framework. Pig is another thing similar to Hive, but it's a procedural format. Tez is um, a mechanism that you can uh, rapidly query data in the Hadoop ecosystem using a SQL-like interface. Um, actually, not SQL-like, it's um, Hive. So it is SQL, but it actually does some things underneath the covers. 
The main difference is if I use hide, it's going to spawn off and not reduce operations. If anyone's ever done this at night or playing in their own systems, they know it's slow. You know, something that you may expect to be very fast working with an Oracle system or MySQL or whatever you're using could take a little bit of time to do in hide. And it, it scales up, it's linear, yes it is, but we often tend to look at the small use case, the small data set, something that's not worth a big data system. It's going to feel slow. Tez is an answer to that. It is a very, very fast um, interface into the system and provides almost uh, to like a, an RDBMS type capability. Solar is just a, a search engine. That, that can use all these things. And actually, all these types of technologies come in some recipe into some custom implementation to fit the problem that you're trying to solve. All problems are not created equal. Therefore, all recipes are not created equal. Most people go through this thought process. They go through buzzword overload. I have a use case. Does it fit my use case? Am I trying to um, find a solution in need of a problem? How do I learn more? Where do I even start? And then you just blow up and then you're done. A lot of organizations will go through the process of, of exploring these things and they say it's too hard, it's too complicated, whatever. And then the nice Oracle rep, hopefully no one, is there an Oracle rep here? No. Oracle rep or IBM, Tiza, and all these people will come in and they say, don't worry, we'll take it off your hands, you do not have to worry. Oh, by the way, there's a trade off. We all learned this in computer science. There's a trade off. All the IP, all the um, understanding of what goes on, you ship off and you're buying from the vendor. When you start to go into the big data realm using these technologies, you're actually investing in your human capital, in you. You are the best domain experts in the problems you're trying to solve. And this is one of the reasons why I'm a huge proponent of this. You can uh, have insights that Oracle cannot give you. They provide a broad range, they try to be all things to all people, but often your use case when you get into these, uh, what we can classify as big data, is very specific, it's niche. There are some things that repeat that a lot of it is niche and you're the best uh, person to understand. Let's talk about what qualifies as big data. A couple, real quick, um, what do you guys think big data is? When you think, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Other than you just hate the word. Disparate systems. Disparate systems. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Some. Yeah, please. Unstructured data. Unstructured data. Okay. Thank you. Please. What's happening is the frequency, the velocity at which we're trying to get at this data. And oftentimes it can either be the size of the data or the computational requirements to process the data that kind of lumps things into a big data problem. Some of the key attributes, you know, you've all heard this volume, variety, velocity, something that's new, it's novel mashups. Um, this is something that that hopefully as you start to go down this path, you follow good programming and architectural patterns and say, I have these interfaces. I'm going to build to an interface. I'm going to build a data dictionary. I know how the data is produced. And now I can produce them in a way that's new, in a new way with the real data processing pipelines. The other thing is expense. Uh, I once went out to Indianapolis for a large email marketing company. Um, they were just buying the Tiza boxes just to stay, to um, keep the executioner off their back. They could not keep up with the demand. Now, they told me at the time that was $750,000 a rack. They were just buying them like they're candy. They, they realized at some point that thing 
will fail and will not get to the point where they need to go. They were going to Hadoop. Hadoop will, and I've seen it scale linearly, um, and it's a rack is not $750,000, I'll tell you that. It's whatever the hardware is and whatever the capital, the human capital, is to get it going. At the very, very core of what we're trying to do, we're trying to produce a query, which is just some function on the large data set. Again, so it's nothing new. But again, but back to the big data aspect, this is often a very large data set, or it's a fast moving data set. Um, you know, if you're doing windowing functions over time, you say, I want the average uh, of some variable over a 10 minute window sliding forward every five minutes. That exists already. That's been solved. But to do that in a streaming way, um, there's, there's these systems. Has anyone heard of complex event processing systems? Okay. These are stream-based systems. So a stream of data comes through. And instead of the old paradigm saying, I'm going to store everything in a big sink, a big database, data bucket, and I'm going to run a query against that. The stream of data comes through, and I'm going to run the query against it as it's flowing through. It's a completely different paradigm, so it shifts it a lot. And people are using these techniques. Spark is one of them. Um, there's another one called Storm. They're, they're using these things to solve real-time problems. Some of the things that come to mind are fraud, or creditworthiness, or um, do I expect a failure in my computer system? Am I starting to see a number of uh, log events that would indicate that I'm going to have a hard drive failure. Or uh, suppose this is uh, one of the people I used to work with, used to consult with the state, um, got hit all the time by uh, uh, DOS attacks or uh, intrusion attacks. One of the things you can do very, very easily with a system like this is uh, take a spigot off your firewall, whatever it may be, stream the data across. And you can start to do real-time analysis and say, hey, we're starting to get a hundred penetration attempts from this IP. Maybe it's even a region. Shut them down. Put a rule in to your firewall, a temporary rule that says shut them down. That is something possible, and that falls within the big data realm. Because streaming data sets can be extremely large. I want to introduce you to another concept. Is, you know, I'm building this up here to start talking about some things. Data lake. You ever heard of Data Lake before? It's relatively new. Data Lake is a dream of a place with data centered architecture where silos are minimized, processing happens with little friction in a scalable, distributed environment. Applications are no longer islands and exist in the data cloud, taking advantage of high bandwidth access to data and scalable computing resource. Data itself is no longer restrained by initial schema decisions and can be exploited freely by the enterprise. Boy, that sounds cool. Um, one of the places I used to work at the Air Force, um, they are silo heavy. We've got Oracle, enterprise licenses, anyone can stand up a database, and they do. And it's a nightmare. You know, from what I used to do as a sysadmin trying to coordinate, it was crazy. This stuff is the dream. And it, it's actually happening. A couple of thoughts. This came from a, an author that's it's really hard to read. That's a Forbes article. Um, some of the things that come to mind immediately on this is, wow, okay, so if we put the data in a common area, what happens to all the security? That's usually the first thing people think of. If I look, put it in here, people I don't want getting at it will get it. That's a big no-no. Um, what about data lineage? How do I track how the data got in and who manipulated it and did, did whatever to it? Um, okay, so if you're familiar with Hadoop, another concept is it's read, uh, sorry, write once, read many kind of operations. Now, in a traditional transactional processing system, that's a killer. You cannot do that with just Hadoop by itself. You can with something like Cassandra or HBase, but it's not for Hadoop. But ultimately, everything flows down into this big data lake, and that's where we want it to be. Now, uh, schema decisions. Uh, anyone ever had something called schema migration headaches? Anyone ever experienced that? Okay. You mind tell me real quick? I mean, whatever you feel free, feel fine to share. What what happened? Uh, we were moving from slices, graphs, HTML, and CMS Yeah. 
that's fairly common. Another common scenario is, so schema, schema migration or schema um, evolution is, I start off with the schema, I'm deploying an update, and there's a change to the schema, and before I can go live, that schema update has to complete. In these large systems, that could be a very expensive process in terms of time, walk-off time. So your, your, your downtime is actually very large. One of the projects I worked on for this, this retailer takes Omniture data. And our Omniture data, if you're a quick stream Omniture data, that's anytime you do anything on the website, we're, they're getting tracking, they're getting a, a, a hit on the system. Millions and millions of hits a day. Over, over their retention period, that equates to many, many terabytes of data. So as the marketing arm of the organization says, I want to track a new variable, or the purpose of this variable we're tracking changes, a lot of organizations will actually go back and reprocess and create a brand new schema to match this new world view. Very, very expensive and very, very time consuming. Big data, some of through some technologies, Avro, if you're writing down buzzwords, Avro is an excellent tool that you can have multiple schemas exist, coexist, without rewriting your data. Very, very powerful. And that's what we do. We start off with 150 columns. Today we're at 450 wide on our tables. Very, very large. And there's millions, actually probably the billions of rows long now. And everything coexists very, very well. So another aspect of big data, this is coming from one of my friends, Dave Wellman, you may have heard of him in the community. It's not about the size of the data, it's about the value of the data within, or within the data. So I know you're gonna hear in just a second that, um, and I'm a firm believer of this too, we can implement all these technologies, we can have lots of blinky lights and all these racks, but until they actually solve a purpose, they're just blinky lights, they're just something to impress your geek friends. You actually have to have actionable data at the end of the day, something that you can go to somebody and say, I'm willing to pay a dollar for that. So this is what every data head wants, right? So this picture of Google data warehouse, um, no. uh, actually should have said it's my face in the wish, <laughs> right? But, you know, I look at that and I think, you know, that's, that's really well organized. I see um, consistent coloring, it's kind of the, hard to see here, but, you know, there are power drops on a periodic interval, there, everything is nicely laid out. I can roll a rack, uh, a crash cart down there and I can uh, fix the system. So what I see is I see uniformity, some nice wiring, it's clean, and it has patterns. As you embark on the big data journey, these are key concepts you're going to want to adhere to. This is a good software development process. As you start to throw data in a warehouse, people tend to forget what data is in that warehouse. They tend to plot different patterns of accessing that data, which creates brittle dependencies on that data. And then now you have to coordinate, um, you have very, very long development cycles coordinating amongst different teams. Um, I saw that at Nike where um, they set up a war room like this, walls full of 80 inch monitors for a deploy, which we did every two weeks. It took us all night to deploy. We were coordinating amongst teams because our schema that we had in our system at the time was so tied to the uh, order processing system to the shipment systems that everyone came online for these things. So deployments took two weeks to organize and, and go through, and our development cycle was supposed to be two weeks. So we spun our wheels on it. A really, really bad experience. In practice, this is the kind of thing that you'll want to embark upon. So it's not a replacement for all the infrastructure. Big data is not the panacea, and it will not solve all your problems. When I say big data, I'm just gonna make a general fudge and say it's okay. Typically these are applications, your little red dots, and they, um, they talk to a data warehouse and then you have a user that's somewhere sitting on the system. What typically happens is, you can see that Hadoop is put side by side with your existing data warehouse. It's not a replacement for it. People often will do dumps from the data warehouse to the Hadoop environment, 
or vice versa, or maybe it's bi-directional. Then you start to run some analytics. This is where the first place people start to see value. They start to say, oh, where can I find efficiencies? Um, what new insights? Maybe I'm having some sort of gap because they're not being filled in our, our marketing plans. The group starts to grow. Um, people start to uh, send data in. It becomes a sink of data. And it does that very, very well. Now, analytics used to be on the outside. Maybe it's a Cognos or a, um, some other BI reporting tool. You actually build these things right into the Hadoop ecosystem, make them aware of Hadoop. And you see more and more applications are then talking directly with it. And finally, the preferred implementation here, according to this Forbes author, it becomes a large portion, does not replace the data warehouse, because again, it doesn't do well with transactional processing. But it becomes a great sink. So it's, you want a synergistic approach, and you actually want measured growth. No one wants to put a target on their head. Okay, that's the worst thing you want to do. Because I've seen organizations spend up millions of dollars in hardware for Hadoop, and at the end of the day, they have a very expensive <coughs> conversion between uh, coal to carbon dioxide. They're not producing anything. So the analytics that are driven, this comes from our last big data competition. This is a, a heat map. This is talking about sentiment analysis for a particular product. The green is representing the, the um, identified product and the red representing um, others. You see, and you can place things on a geographical region. This, again, you can do it in Oracle, you can do it in MySQL. Um, the data set was just large enough that we uh, did it in this kind of world. This represents something that's really interesting to me. Uh, this is a graph analysis or a connected component problem. Um, take LinkedIn. You guys all familiar with LinkedIn? When I was in Oregon, working at Nike, somehow they figured out that my landlord and I should be connected even though I had no professional connection to them. Got me my address. Pretty sneaky, but they're pretty good at connecting people together. This last big deployment that I did with Hadoop, um, um, was to create this connected component. Um, the idea was we take streaming data, such as Omniter, we take point of sale data, we take back end, other, all the other back end systems, and we actually try and create a common view of what a customer is. Well, that's, that's something that I had to get my mind around. What is a customer? And aren't they just a record? They're one, two, three, four, five? No, actually, this is another term for this is 360 or omni channel. As I'm on my laptop, or I'm on my iPad, or I'm on my phone, I actually represent myself differently to a, a target system. To retailers, this is actually really important because I may look at something at work, I may share it with somebody, I may go home and they may log in, or maybe my wife logs in, but I share the same cookie with, uh, with the system or something like that. They need to start making these differentiating decisions because who I am drives what they want to recommend to me. It becomes a personalization engine. This, this is an interesting problem for, for this retailer. And one of the things I want to have, sorry. We'll just leave it there so I won't spend time. If you can remember that graph, that graph, um, some of the pitfalls some of the things we did. We started off with Hadoop, and we were actually required by a third-party vendor to use Hive. Hive is the SQL interface, and it's the only way we could get at our underlying data. Now, that didn't work very well, because Hive isn't, it's still fairly new, and it didn't have all the advanced features. We started implementing going on this path, um, and we found out that the processing cycles from start to finish would take over two weeks of a cluster. So that's, for, ours, for us, that was 25 machines for two weeks, 100% utilization. That, that was the time to, time to market for that information, way too long. We changed some algorithms. We moved to PIG for some other things. PIG is more of a procedural, functional language kind of thing, not SQL. And it allowed us to actually drop that time to two hours. So this is something that you will see as you embark into big data. 
And the reason why I say stay away from something like Pentaho, low drives from Pentaho, is if you don't understand what's happening underneath the scenes, under the covers, you'll run into this mistake and say, oh, it's big data, it should just take two weeks. No, actually, it, it should go a lot faster. So our particular problem, we were doing it group by, and uh, we're grouping by multiple columns in Hadoop. Now I'm kind of looking up the curtain here. In Hadoop, what that really represents is I'm going to create a hash on every single value that I'm grouping by. So not only do I have to manage all these data to flow through the system, now I have to manage all these hashes. I have to shuffle them, I have to sort them, and put them in the same buckets. This process was extremely expensive and inefficient. We found a way around this doing custom programming uh, that we introduced that's outside the feature set uh, produced in Hadoop. Um, and we were able to get this down in two hours. So this, again, is another big uh, point. You are the domain experts. You understand the algorithms. You understand what is important. Um, no one solution fits everything. So Hadoop itself, Hive, Pig, all these things are extensible, meaning you can create your own functions and you can put them into the system. And you get these huge efficiencies and economies of scale. Um, Another experience uh, that we encountered with this is um, we started with a batch model on purpose. Batch model meaning we take all the data, we process 100% of the data every single time. The data is going to be one of your biggest problems as you embark on big data, particularly when I get to the unstructured data or the data that changes. They're from Omniture, but Omniture data is extremely messy. Okay, anyone ever dealt with Omniture data? So our marketing people tend to put commas in in uh, some of the values that they send up. So anyone familiar with like the ETL process knows that commas are evil, they're horrible. And so what happened is Omniture would send us a delimited file with commas. And so having an address in there with commas completely messed up all the schemas. It's a very common data problem, right? So you have unstructured data or something coming in from a source system that doesn't impose some sort of limitations on structure, and you're trying to suck it in. A good practitioner of this will spend 50 to 80% of their time just getting to know their data. I'm gonna start. I've, I've heard it time and time again. Fortune 500 company, I just went to a massive retailer, even bigger than the one I'm working with now. We know our data. In the very next sentence, oh, our data constantly throws us surprises and we're constantly having severity one alerts where I'm all night trying to solve. To me, that's a huge data problem. And it's a very brittle system. So what the promise of what we're trying to do is we're trying to decouple things. We're trying to code the interfaces. We're trying to create failure points and safety valves along the way so you can depending on business process, you can move forward with the computation or you can stop, but it never fails slightly. Okay, enough on that. Um, so that's data analytics. By the way, that, that process, um, it took us um, about a year to get us from start to finish going, and, uh, but we're seeing immediate lift in revenue in, in the millions of dollars range. So it's, it's, it's a powerful tool. We took it slow, we did bite off more than we can chew. And again, the world is wide, there are lots of buzzwords. How do you know what that scope should be? And that's just gonna come with knowing your, your business, what your capabilities of your team is, and so forth. The next thing, analysis evolution. <clears throat> Often starts with a statistical analysis. What, why in the world is this happening? Forecasting, you know, what happens if these trends continue, predictive, what will happen next? And optimization, what is the best that can happen? And then you go into the novel mashups. Most people get to Hadoop and they start, they start, start and stop right here. I would actually recommend you start here too, don't skip. This will provide insights into your data sets, again, with 
going back to spending a lot of time with your data that you haven't seen before. What's happening? And then you can start to increase your capabilities by adding to these new, uh, new algorithms that are on top of these things. There are extremely fantastic tools for doing things in real time. So optimization. Um, there's a tool out there that will uh, you will take all the, the goods in a grocery store, and if I adjust the price on my Diet Coke, how does that impact Twinkie sales? It's the butterfly effect. How, how does one even calculate that? But that's, that's something that they're doing, is the optimization problem. And it's, it's solved using a tool like this. The successful projects, there's clear objectives, there's sufficient time, and I want to get into a little technical thing and into my, my lot of time here, so I'm going to go fast. Iterate. Take something, go iterate. What I have seen that works really well is more like a scrum or a Kanban or something like that, but waterfall fails. I don't know what methodology you're using here, but waterfall is not good for this. Um, iteration is key as you get new insights into the system. The business is always going to come back and say, or the customer is always going to come back and say, what can I do? And it's up to you to, to manage scope for you. Some tips and tricks. Sleep on it. Don't get excited without sleeping on it. Um, are you solution in search of a need? Use the scientific method. Um, I've seen this out there a lot. People are very, very um, used to a prescriptive coding environment. I have a web service, I need to talk to a database. Okay, so what do I need to do? I need to create a bug, some DAOs, some interfaces, maybe some command patterns, or, you know, it's still fairly well structured, but the data is already structured, it's already there. Scientific method with the big data is, I have a hypothesis. How am I gonna test this? How am I gonna make this work? What is reasonable? Um, one of the, the things, and I'll just tell you, but if you ever, ever interview with me, I'll ask, if I have a table full of pennies, and I stack them a meter high, you know, maybe it's a four by eight table. How would I know if, uh, if I stacked them all on a single column, would that be taller than the Sears Tower or not? Think about that. Another one, I mean, I live in Utah, I actually had someone ask me. If, if you live in Utah, you drive a car, and you're on an interview, so you got five minutes, give me a reasonable aspect estimate to the number of gas stations in the state. That, that one was more of a thought experiment than actually a number. How in the world do you figure that thing out? But that's the same type of process you're going to go with these big data, especially in unstructured data. Um, in a real world example, in this connected component algorithm, we created a safety valve, a blowout valve, saying we could not process this data using the current techniques. So we shoved it into a different area. Um, and then all of a sudden, the, the business comes up and said, hey, our CEO, they're not showing up in the results set. What happened? And then we had to go back and figure out, oh, well, hey, you know what happened is, because it's connected components, the marketing director sent an email to um, some other director, sent another email to another director to the CEO. All of a sudden, we had this graph, this connected component graph, with 72 million events. Huge. And that 72 million event was much larger than what our underlying um, machine learning algorithm could handle, so it was uh, split off. So we had to go back, we had to test, we had to figure out how in the world could we break this apart and actually process using, because we didn't know the data, we didn't, had no idea it was that well connected. And we called it a hyper-connected, like everything is connected. The in and out degrees were many, many thousands per node. Um, Another thing that I want to actually talk about briefly is um, you already have existing systems. You guys could use MATLAB or SAS or something like that. Like an existing statistical platform. Maybe R. Yeah. Our data scientists use MATLAB. And there are specific algorithms that MATLAB um, uses in Fortran on the system to do a cluster or spectral clustering kind of algorithm. 
to do gives you the promise. It's a framework. I can think in single threaded application. I don't have to worry about distributing everything out. I can think in single threaded mode. I want this operation to go to this variable, next row, do this operation, and this is the output. I don't have to worry about distributing, and I don't have to worry about combining everything back together. That's, that's what it gives me. What we were able to do is take the underlying Fortran code, deploy it out on our, our cluster, and actually have Hadoop execute the Fortran code so we could have apples to apples comparison with what MATLAB was producing. This was a big win. I mean, we could go back and we could say, we could validate that the cluster was producing um, good results. And we didn't have underlying algorithm problems. Next thing, some, another tip. Um, it definitely does not fit well in, in some development methodologies, which I already mentioned. Involve yourself in the community. There's a lot of information out there. A lot of people are very willing to help. And I always recommend pet projects. What do you have running at home or on the side? What, how do you keep yourself sharp? And these kind of explorations is what will help you. Okay, and I'm sure that, I just want to wrap it up real quick. Uh, good and the bad, it's mostly open source, and, and I'll leave it to you to figure out how, where this fits. You have access to professional services. Um, uh, it's schemaless data analysis. Uh, you really get to know your data, good and bad. The maturity is, it's, definitely there, but it's not horrible. Um, data science is always evolving. When I graduated from college, the algorithms we're using now did not exist. They were very, very slow to come out in the traditional RDBMS, so we created them ourselves and put them on the cluster. One of the little downsides is often you're purpose-built. Again, you're not all things to all people. You're trying to answer a specific question. There are common shared services but on the top, your application is generally trying to answer a single question. Debugging, integration testing, regression testing is difficult. That's one of the things that is often last on any uh, team's uh, bucket list. And then you have to have cross-disciplinary involvement. So your um, engineers, your data scientists, your stakeholders all get to rub shoulders and get to really know one another. If you don't do this, project will fit. I don't know if this is specific to big data, but I do know that it will fit. Um, in the interest of time, I, I will share these with you later. I want to make sure I get plenty of time later. Uh, of course, I'm going to have to go through all this. This was getting into the actual concept of PIG, um, into the, the data types. You see, this is the kind of language that I'm talking about with PIG. I have some defaults. I'm going to do some sets, which is your, basically your environment setup. I just want to load some data, and I'm going to store it right back out. Very, very simple, like the hello world of PIG. <coughs> so what I want to leave with you with is how, hopefully, if you're starting to think critically, how do I take this mess Everything that's out there, all these FUD, you know, there's a holy war going on between Cassandra and HBase, which is a better NoSQL store. And actually, it's expanded to Mongo and to you know, uh, some of the other uh, proprietary versions. And how do I convert it to a structured, well patterned, well thought out, money making machine? Now, money making is where I, I fit in because that's the retail side of me. But money making means it's efficient, it's not a burn on the environment. I will have a job in 10 years because I'm not spending all the money on the hardware. So I'll leave that with q and I want to maybe delay until afterwards to make sure I get plenty of time. Um, but I will be around if you have any questions. I, I'm here to answer them more. Please come out to any of the meetings. So okay. thank you very much. Wow, thanks everyone. We, uh, we don't have much in common, I have to tell you. I'm actually not sure why I'm a big data analyst. Um, I had to convince myself I deserved it. And I think I managed to, but I, I'm a marketing person. And normally, technology people and marketing people don't mix. And so frankly, I've never talked to technology people before, ever. <laughs>
So I'm a little bit, you know, worried that you're going to throw rotten tomatoes at me, but I promise not to say the word doom, sorry. I really don't care. I don't care what technology you're going to use. We happen to use SQL and Mongo, whatever. But I do care about whether or not we're going to find what we need to out of our data. And let me just be really clear. One of the things that you can do with big data is take action immediately. For example, you could change the, the traffic light signals in, a real, in an area real time based on traffic patterns, right? And that could be a big data use case. That's not the kind I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about actually answering some questions that drive some decisions that change the world. And I do love to change the world. But let me just tell you a little bit about me and my, and I'm going to get this I'm not a technical person. <laughs> challenges I think you're probably faced with is that people like me come along and they ask you to put things together that you never thought you could ever put together. Why am I on this list? Well, at Adobe we have a problem. And I'm sorry, I have to correct you. We don't call it Omnitra anymore. <laughs> it's called Adobe Analytics. Adobe bought Omnitra about five years ago and in the process created a marketing technology arm. And that marketing technology arm can which, by the way, is 70% of all of U.S. revenue flowing through that cloud. 33% of all travel bookings flowing through that cloud. Every time you use a car configurator, I see that data. Trillions of transactions in lots of pieces all over the place, right? So not that different from you. But what do I do? Well, the fact is that I release news stories to the press. Why? Because Adobe has an awareness problem. What do you think of when you think of Adobe? PDF, Flash. Oh God, please don't think of Flash anymore. That was bad for us. Um, you think of Photoshop. You think of the creative stuff. Because that's what Adobe is known for. Well, the fact is that we are the biggest enterprise player in the marketing technology space. And no one knows. So what do I do? Well, I put together these news stories so that people will find out that these things, and these are the kinds of things we do. We report on Chrome uh, browser use. We report on mobile television apps. We report on what's going to happen in the future with all kinds of things relative to the big data sets that we can analyze. And that, as I mentioned, is truly big. But I don't care that it's big. I just care that it actually has critical value because I'm, I'm actually the storyteller. I'm not really the person who has to deal with the fact that we need lots and lots of boxes full of this stuff. 
I know that some of you are, and God bless you for that, really. Because when it comes to my analysis, if you didn't do what you're doing, I can't do what I'm doing. And it really does take a, a lot of different skill sets, and that's something I'm going to talk about in just a second. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you three stories, all right? And the idea behind these stories is to tell you how they kind of came to be and what we need to do, and hopefully to spark some of your imagination about how you can take some of these examples into your world in whatever department you're in, across different departments, in the technology space that you live in. All right, so here's the thing. I predict that on September 9th, Apple will release phones that have bigger screen sizes. And if I were actually one to play the stock market, and I'm not saying you should, right? You didn't hear that from me. I think their stock price will go up because they're going to show that they can recapture some of the value that they've lost. Why do I know that? Or why do I think that? Well, the data doesn't tell me this. I made this up. I'm, I'm actually pretty good at making stuff up. Sounds pretty reasonable. But here's what the data told me. And here's how we actually thought about this. It came from a bottoms up insight. Now, when I say bottoms up, it means that you found some sort of outlier in the data and you ask yourself a question about, well, what is this? Is this, can this be right? Let me tell you what I did. Back last year, right there, I put out a press release saying that tablet browsing has surpassed smartphone usage. Got the press, it did Forbes, did, you know, did Wall Street Journal stuff, it was fantastic. And then I was wrong, like really quickly. It only lasted for like half a second. I mean, I happened to pick that half a second, but if you looked at the trends, you know, it should have gone like this, right? What happened? So my, my analyst brought me this data and he said, something happened to our data, right? This is a bottoms up analysis. So then we looked at each other and said, well, why? What could it be? So we kind of threw out some ideas. And one of those ideas was, hmm, maybe it's that people are not wanting to pay for data connections on their tablets. So we looked at all the data saying whether or not a connection to a website visit came on a Wi-Fi or on a, a 3G or 4G data connection. We thought, okay, maybe that's it. And it does turn out that tablets are 93% on Wi-Fi, right? So it's really a laptop. It's not really a mobile device. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, what about those big phones? What about the Galaxy Tab kind of phones? Could that be it? Now let me tell you what it takes. This simple little chart right there, and I'm sure you guys can appreciate what it takes to put a simple little chart like this in. This is about four trillion transactions worth of information. And then in order to figure this out, we had to take 35,000 different device model types and classify them by screen size. One of the biggest big data problems I have all the time is taxonomy, adding meaning to a bunch of data and, and being able to segment it all, right? So this took my poor analyst like three weeks for this silly little chart that just shows this downward trend, which I pro probably could have told you looks like that. But when I looked at this data, I said, oh, what's going on here is that in some cases, people's use case for their smartphone is more, has more capacity because they have more mobile data connections so they can use it more times, and it's getting to a screen size where it's big enough for them to use. So, then I went out to external factors. Now this is the other thing I want to say about big data. You have lots of information in-house. It may not tell you the whole story. I wanted to go out and get some more corroboration. So what I did was I did some research and I thought, oh, look at that. The Best Buy CEO says tablet sales are crashing. Interesting. So my browser data actually does look like what's happening in the market. And then we also did a research study, right? So sometimes we use big data, sometimes like 400 people, not very big data. I could do this in Excel, right? Well, what did I find out? When the primary phone, mobile phone device, the Android smartphone was going up, I look at, look at iPhone right there. Wow, okay, so now I'm like, all right, I can make this statement that Apple needs to put out a bigger size phone or they're gonna be losing market share, and in fact, they're already losing market share, and so that's what's going to happen. That's how this big data analysis turned into a story which turned into taking a stand. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Okay, so let's go through another one. This is, these are the steps, and I'm going to kind of skip this. But basically, we performed all this research, we looked at our data, 
and then we developed the story, and then we gave the point of view. Now let's talk about another one. This is social media data, which I think it may be the root of where big data sort of came from, because social media data was vastly unstructured, right? It's just a lot of text. And all that text data really became difficult for everyone to deal with, because what do you do with it when you don't know what you want to do with it? So this happens to be social media mentions data. So this is an analysis that comes from a hypothesis that I made of human life, all right? There was no data around to support this. I thought, hmm, self, I see movie titles in my Facebook feed a lot. You guys talk about movies in your Facebook or online too? I thought, well, I wonder, I wonder if I measure how many times I see a movie name appear, if I could figure out how profitable the movie is going to be. And so I asked my analyst to investigate this question. And so what he did was he started to test. And he tested it two years ago, and he determined that at the 20-day mark, the difference between a profitable and unprofitable movie always had this pattern. So then we actually went ahead and we built a prediction. And we predicted which movies were going to be profitable and which movies were going to fail 20 days prior to them coming out. And it wasn't that it took a PhD to do this. We didn't do any heavy math. There wasn't anything about it that was intimidating or difficult. And that's one of the messages I want to give you guys is don't overcook the meal. If it's really, you know, if it tastes fine and, and you can serve it, serve it. it. It doesn't need to have 15 different pieces of corroborating evidence in order for us to actually make it useful. So here we are, predicting the summer box office winners and losers in the Hollywood Reporter. Like, that's kind of a bucket list thing for me, getting the Hollywood Reporter. That was pretty cool, right? But then this, this whole um, Edge of Tomorrow one, Everyone who saw it was like, oh, it's a really good movie. Did you guys see it? Did you watch? No, you didn't see it, see? <laughs> All right. It freaked me out. So I'm like, on opening weekend, I'm like, watching Box Office Mojo. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be OK? <laughs> Am I going to be an idiot here? And what I discovered was 17 out of 17 movie predictions were right. We've been right every single time. We predicted Guardians of the Galaxy would be a smash hit. We predicted Edge of Tomorrow would fail at the theaters. And I thought, I'm I, I'm out of the office a lot because I travel and I speak, but what happened was I'm actually in the grocery store, pushing the cart around, getting stuff in bags, and my phone rings, it's forwarded to my cell phone, and an SVP from Sony Pictures is on the phone. Hey, I uh, saw you in the Hollywood Reporter. I want to know how you do this and are you selling it? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm in the grocery store right now. But basically, I just told him, look, it's really not that hard. I think sometimes we get all wrapped around the axle in thinking that all this big data stuff has to be really hard. It doesn't have to be hard. Don't make it hard if it's not, okay? All right. Skip that. Okay. This isn't out yet. This is actually coming out soon. Um, once again, we looked at social media that mentions and the idea was to do a story on the NFL and the fact that the NFL season was starting. And one of the things I've learned is that when I put out a new story related to something topical that's happening soon, I get a lot more press, right? And that's my goal, is to get lots of press. So this is something I, I thought we would do. Well, this is an example of an analysis that wasn't really a question. It was mostly just, you know, what can we say about something? And the reason why I wanted to share it with you is that it comes from multiple pieces of data glued together into finding the analysis. And this is important because it took multiple databases for us to find this information out. And that's sometimes going to be your challenge, right? You might have a silo in your particular area, but until you actually start working across multiple different data sets, you can't develop some of the higher level insights that are possible using a cross pollination. Okay, so what did we find? Well, we looked at social media mentions data by where the response, the, the social, I don't know, user, I guess is the right word, where they were, all right? So what we discovered was that 20% of the NFL social media 
mentions were coming from outside the United States. 20%. Well, that seems kind of big. Do you think that's big? Where's the thing? That's big, right? And then we thought, well, okay, why is that happening? And we started looking at what the NFL was doing and realizing that they were playing games over in England, right? And the teams that were playing were the ones picking up all of the outside the United States online to access any content? Raise your hands if you did. You know, we power all that. Love that. Well, what you did then was you discovered how to access digital content. And it, look, it has changed your viewing patterns forever. What we, did, what we learned about that information is that once you sign up and sign in and figure out how to do it, which by the way is not that easy, sorry about that, then you start to consume more and more things and the world now can consume things digitally. So where does that story go? Here's what I say. World Cup's coming to the United States. They're gonna come to the United States because they wanna build a fan base here because the NFL is showing them that it works. And I guarantee you the next time they have to choose, guarantee, I didn't say that. I feel highly likely that the next time they have to choose a city, it's gonna be a US city. So, you know, Salt Lake? I'm in the governor's office right now, I'm thinking, better be at my bid in, right? All right, get these notes. This is what I'm getting at. Sometimes we're down here talking about information needs. And that's where Matt spent a lot of time, although, you know, craftsmanship and science is also important. Um, I, I don't get anywhere unless I have access to data, and all of that data has to And that's a lot of the hard work of big data right there. The craftsmanship and science, I don't think that, I mean, you know, Matt, I, I like that server room. That's real pretty. I just don't think it's ever going to look like that or be like that. Because entropy rules. And, and you're going to get it all set up, and eventually someone's going to come and knock it all around, and it's just not going to be pretty. And so, in fact, data is going to be messy probably forever, and how much data will be messy forever. But, you know, we'll learn to live with it. That's the craftsmanship, the science part. Insight synthesis, that's where we create lots and lots of tables, right? And when I look at an analysis from one of my, um, my team members, I see maybe 70 tables, maybe 100, crossing this way and that way and this way. And when we look at it from all kinds of angles, and when we, when we really see all those insights, we could 
stop right there and put together a dashboard and then ship it out, and that would be really boring. I hate dashboards. They're still useless. Does anyone else think? I mean, do you guys put dashboards together? You probably have to, right? Yeah, you do. Oh, I thought, I feel your pain. Communication and storytelling and taking a stand. This is where oftentimes data scientists get really hungry. That's why I exist and what I do. But this is where you're going with a lot of your insight of big data. If you're not getting to the taking a stand part, then do the tree fall in the woods? Does it matter? Did all of your hard work really result in anything if no decision or action was taken? And again, I'm, I'm not talking about the real time, like actual optimization of stoplights kind of stuff. I'm talking about an insight of something that's going to change the lives of people like me in the state of Utah. So it's a piece of cake, right? Um, your ingredients, you have lots of ingredients. And if you put all your ingredients into little bowls, I, I think of that as kind of what you're doing with some of your big data work. Is you're almost like this, this sous chef, right? You're creating a bunch of stuff for the chef to put together and then somebody has to plate the meal and make it look really pretty. And I convinced myself after thinking of that, because this is sort of what I do right here, right? That I actually am a big data analyst. Because without that, it doesn't get to the restaurant, it doesn't get us, get us a dollar, right? And there is one thing that you and I have in common, we need money. You might need more money than me, I have to say, but well, I need money too, I need to prove value every to my management, and so do you. Otherwise, you don't get more resources, you don't get more budget, you don't get to you know, do the cool things that you want to do with the capacity that you have. If we just take all those ingredients and like pour them all into one dish without measuring them, without thinking about what we're going to try and taste like at the end, I don't know if this is going to taste very good. And sometimes I worry that big data analysis is just putting a whole bunch of stuff I know, let's just put all our data in one place, we'll be good, right? And that to me is sort of like this. You're not necessarily going to be able to bake a good pie out of this or a cake. It's just, it's going to be too messy for that use. All right. Creepy. By the way, this ad right here, the 1984 ad, I worked at that ad agency um, that did that. And it's still a very iconic of that whole notion of Big Brother. And I get the question myself out of my own data analysis if I'm crossing the creepy line with the things I know, with the fact that when the social media mentions are predictive of actual more public results. That might, for some people, be a little bit over the line. When does it become too much? And you have a bigger problem than you and I do because you have citizens and you have the citizens' data and they really expect you to be kind to it. But what I've seen happen, and this is this is kind of a story of the Disney Magic Band. Has anyone used a Disney Magic Band yet? All right, let me tell you what it does. It gives you access to stuff in the park. It gives you fast pass, and but it also is tracking your movements in the park. Creepy? Not creepy. What do you think? Okay, who thinks it's creepy? Who thinks it's not creepy? Right. Okay, so the person who um, wrote an article that, that caused me to put this picture up, this came from a man who would not get a fast pass, you know, the, the, the t um, freeway fast pass kind of thing, because he thought it was creepy. And yet, he would put a magic man on his kid's wrist and let Disney track them to the park. Why? Well, the lines faster. It was value for him and it was worth it. And so to a certain degree when we look at the expense trade-off between the big data analysis we're doing and what the world wants out of it, value matters. If it's going to deliver value then you're going to get away with a little bit more. <clears throat> that does not give me value. That camera right there. Now if you tell me that it's going to give me value then I might be willing to But right now, that's not my example. All right, saving time. I gave a go.
gob of information to the PSA. I don't know why I had to, because I already have a concealed carry permit. I got checked out by the FBI. Why do these databases not talk to each other? I don't know. But anyway, I said, okay, global entry. I travel a lot. I don't like to stand in these lines. When I was in Sydney, the line in immigration was an hour and 40 minutes. When I came into the Seattle um, TSA office and I came through with a global entry into the United States, put my passport down, took a picture of my face, bam, I was gone. It took me two minutes. And I'm more than willing to make a trade off of my privacy for that kind of time saving. What I'm not willing to do is go through. Maybe it starts with that question, and then one of the things you discover is that you have home tech workers, and therefore you want to have home tech worker educational programs or whatever. That's the top down, taking a stand all the way down to the data analysis. All right, let's take another one. Um, let's just say that you learned, and I'm not sure if this is true, you guys can tell me, that lower state tax rates are causally related to the reduction of question is, what's the optimal state tax rate in order to reduce the jobless rate? And how does
does that result in revenue that, the, that maximizes its potential? Because obviously more people have a job, increases revenue, but higher tax rates increase revenue in a different way, so what's the optimal equation? That could be something that you did a, a data analysis that really told the state legislature what to do or informed the public how to, how to think about a taxation policy. Uh, public health. Let's just say skin and cancer is higher in Well, then the question was, okay, if the state is growing and skin cancer is a problem in the state, how much will the state's health care costs go up because of skin cancer and the next five years? I don't know if I'm touching on anything here that really matters to you guys, but I'm trying to give you an idea of what a person like me is going to ask you. Because that's how you have to figure out how to do all of your technology questions. Okay, so getting down to the end. Collaboration, and collaboration across your data silos, collaboration across states. I saw some things in what they had given me that I thought was really awesome. One of them was um, creating an advanced cyber infrastructure that is shared by state government and higher education. Sharing, to partnering. Higher education, state, business, all that stuff together. Sometimes I'm gonna come to you and ask you for your data so that I can do an analysis for Adobe. Have you ever thought of that? I'm gonna probably be on your doorstep soon I'm doing an analysis of documents, right? I have one of the things that Adobe does is they have a technology called um, EchoSign, which does um, electronic document signatures. So I'm going to do an analysis that I'm going to try to see if I can predict um, the economy based on the number of new account openings for credit unions. Well, what do I need to know? Well, I actually need some economic data from you, probably. And I'm going to be knocking on your door asking. Utilizing external data. This is what I talked about. Sometimes it's little data, sometimes it's big data, sometimes it's qualitative data, sometimes it's quantitative. But mixing it all together is where the insights come from. And starting with the hypothesis there is really bad. Prioritize. This is one thing that I firmly believe in is that we have to deliver value every quarter. Everything you're working on should be driven to some value proposition that we can give our constituents fund us, whoever that is that's going to see that our work is worth continuing and maybe growing on, we have to do that every quarter. And that sometimes means that we have to build the car while we're driving it. It's not usually the case that we get a year to build something in the world and put out a unit. All right, not that. Boiling the ocean or the data leak. <laughs> I hadn't heard that term. But if you put together huge amounts of data and you have no idea what you're unlikely to be successful in the end. Attempting real time, you hear this word a lot. All right, let me just caveat that. If it's really to put together something that changes the stoplight so that I can go faster through some onboard to another piece, I'm good with that. But if it's really for analysis purposes, most of the time something that's closer to real time but not real time is good enough. And so that's the thing I want to leave you with on that front. It's good enough and actionable is better than taking a long time I saw this one and I went, ooh, creepy. Creepy. And it does have value to me, but if I don't believe that it's actually going to work, then it doesn't really have value to me, right? If I, if I think that you guys can prevent me from getting um, mugged in advance because of your predictive algorithms about a particular region, then maybe I'm okay with that, but I don't actually think you're going to be able to do that. So that's why it's creepy for me. Um, and if you think of big data as an IT or technology problem, then you're leaving yourself in a box. And frankly, it's not a very fun box, right? What you have at your capacity is the ability to change the world. And until you reach that goal, it's not as much fun to do every day. And why do something that's not fun? You want to have this be a bigger problem that you're trying to solve, something of higher order magnitude. Not just, um, your problem isn't putting this database with this database or migrating that thing over to that thing. Your problem is how do you change the state of the economy? Health, economic prosperity, jobs, families, education, all that stuff. And how cool, I mean, what I do every day doesn't really change the world. What you do every day absolutely does. So if it were me, I would pick some needs, some interesting questions, and I would go after them. I would figure out what data I needed and what skills I needed, and then I would create that.
have vision to answer that question. And I would do that over and over and over again because every time I do it, I learn more about what I'm trying to accomplish rather than trying to figure out how to architect 